creating their own citizen science projects or, you know, actually like leading these things. Um, so it always makes me happy that we have a, a, an audience. We have people from all over the world who join, but a lot of folks from the NC State community, which I love. Cool. Love it. All right. And everybody, we are live on YouTube. I, um, I encourage you to say hi in the chat throughout the event. We love to hear from you. Um, but I also, let me put the YouTube link, all panelists and attendees. So you all don't have to worry about catching every single thing um, because uh, you'll be able to watch the live stream later if you so choose. Um, but yeah, so let's, let's kick things off with some polls as people come into the room. So I'm going to go ahead and launch those on my screen. The first poll question is, are you part of the NC State community? And you can define this really broadly. It could mean that you went to NC State, you're an alum. It could mean that you're currently a student. It could mean that you're just a fan of the Wolfpack. Um, whatever that means to you, if you feel like you're part of the NC State community, feel free to answer yes. It also could mean you becoming to make it count Monday every week and you really feel like you're a part of things now. That's fine too. Um, Okay, our answers are coming in. I'll give folks like a second more to vote. And we're gonna end the poll, three, two, one, and end poll, share results. So it looks like the majority of folks are part of the NC State community, which is great. Some folks aren't, which is also great. Welcome, welcome. You can be part of the global citizen science community as well. Um, all right, let's do our second poll question. Um, for those of you who are part of the NC State community, or even those who aren't, do you live in North Carolina? Um, we just like to know that because um, we've been very North Carolina centric this whole series. We've been spotlighting projects across the state. A few projects from across the border, you know, we had Philo on the line, um, Jerome Wadispiel from Canada, but we like to know how are we addressing our North Carolina audience? And I'm gonna end the poll and share my results. Looks like uh, most of you are not in North Carolina, but a few of you are, which is great. Um, it's great that you're not either. All are welcome at these. And for those of you who are part of the NC State community, are you in the Citizen Science Club? So how many club members are we serving? Um, this event, uh, for some backstory, the idea originally is we thought it would be a lot of club members on the line each week, because um, that was something that they like, having guest speakers. Um, it looks like so far, none of you are in the club. Interesting. Well, I know a lot of them watch the recording, so we're going to end the poll there, share those results. Um, all right. And our last question is, and to be completely honest, it's totally okay if you're not sure or your answer is no. Have you done citizen science before? All right, we're at 100% yes so far. Oh my gosh, it keeps coming. We have one no. One person on the line has never done citizen science before. Very cool. Welcome. You are in the right place to get started. Okay. And I'm going to close the poll in three, two, one, and share results. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here at Make It Count Monday. Um, this is a, a joint project of SciStarter, SciStarter.org and um, the NC State Citizen Science Campus and their public science cluster. Um, I always start off each week before we introduce our guests our, um, and our featured projects with uh, the SciStarter.org forward slash NCSU home. So if you're watching on YouTube or you know, you're in the Zoom room with us, feel free to minimize this window and go ahead and type this into your browser because this is your one stop for citizen science. You can find all sorts of things here and I'll actually be linking to a few sitsci.org projects after this event. Um, but we add projects up here frequently. This is where we have our Make It Count Monday each week. So as you can see, uh, Greg's bio is linked here as well as the sitsci.org website. So you can find that. Um, and it's our season lineup. So uh, Dr. Cooper's on next week about the Crowd the Tap project. Then we have Marine Debris Tracker the week after. And we're um, ending the season with a holiday special. Uh, so I'll I'll, I'll mostly spend that special interviewing my co-host Deja about her amazing work with the triangle bird count because I have lots of burning questions about that. I've been a big fan for a while. So these are you, you definitely don't want to miss this. And thanks for being here tonight. Um, for the person who said they hadn't done citizen science before, I really recommend the tutorial on this page. Even if you have done citizen science before, it kind of steps you through the field and gives you an overview of all the diversity in the citizen science world. So definitely check that out. 
And then of course we have a few featured projects and we pop new ones up here all the time. So actually that'll probably be one of my questions for uh, Dr. Greg Newman later when we get to the Q&A portion. What SITSI.org project have you been doing lately and what would you recommend to the NC State community? Um, and then of course at the bottom we have um, additional materials and past recordings of Make It Count Monday. So that was our little overview, our welcome. Um, if you all have anything to say, I urge you to be vocal in the chat. We love um, interacting with you and hearing your questions, but I'm gonna pass it to my co-host Deja, who's gonna give our intro and then introduce our speaker. Uh, Deja, take it away. Hey everybody, welcome back to Make It Count Monday. If today is your first time tuning in, welcome. Thank you for joining us. This week we have um, a special guest, uh, Dr. Newman, who is a research scientist, ecologist, and informatics specialist at the Natural Resource Ecology Laboratory at Colorado State University. He received his PhD from CSU in Citizen Science in uh, community-based monitoring and ecological informatics. His current research focuses on designing and evaluating the effectiveness of cyber infrastructure support systems for a citizen science program. His research interests include evaluating various citizen science program models, understanding the socio-ecological benefits of engaging the public in scientific research, designing and evaluating data management systems for socio-ecological research, assessing the value of local and traditional ecological knowledge for conservation and education outcomes and developing spatial temporal decision support systems. I am so excited uh, to have him as a guest this week because I am super interested in a lot of these topics. And I think involving um, local and traditional ecological knowledge in citizen science projects are so, so important. So um, I hope you all join me in welcoming Dr. Greg Newman this week. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I was wondering. Gotcha. <laughs> Thanks <laughs> was, for that. I, I, I was laughing when, during your introduction because I was like, well, basically, I'm a person who loves citizen science. <laughs> Keep it simple. <laughs> so, I, I mean, well, to segue from that, what? how did you get involved in citizen science? You know, it's a fun story, and I'll keep it short. Um, I was a plant ecologist by training. I was studying noxious weeds and invasive plants for, to help land managers um, keep it. Think of it as a wildfire coming across the, the landscape. It's a bad, bad thing for species diversity and conservation. And so, lot, in, introduced plants from another continent spread across the the, the, the the landscape. And we recognized right away that we were trying to make weather maps, call them, you know, for weed maps for where the weeds were going to be worse. And when we did that, it was just like any bad weather forecast. Our models were, were not so great. And so the reason they weren't is we were sampling only on public lands. We needed to have insight from private lands. And the only way to access those lands in a nice, friendly way is to ask politely that the public um, private landowners um, actually contribute. And so that was my foray into citizen science. Awesome. So can you tell us a little bit more about sitsci.org? Yeah, you bet. So as I mentioned in that intro, it, you know, basically we, we were a bunch of ecologists at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab studying invasive plants. We started asking ranchers, where are your weeds? Because our models aren't working, our predictions aren't working. And so ranchers were submitting data to a platform actually at the time that we, our lab had built. It was a web application. It was called the National Institute for Invasive Species Science. It was led by the USGS, um, the United States Geological Survey, um, USGS agency. And that was the first foray into citizen science for me. What that, where that led was serendipity. We started asking why just not just weeds, why just plants? And at the time we looked around and we saw eBird and we saw Kokoraz and we saw Project Budburst and a few others. And that was about it. We said, well, why just birds? Why just um, weather? Why not community science for any topic? And so what we did is we got inspired by that vision and that mission. And we said, well, we should be able to spin up citizen science projects on any topic anywhere um, and be more flexible in the projects we create. So we took the National Institute of Invasive Species kind of back database and we transformed it into a more public friendly platform called sitsci.org. Awesome, very cool. So um, I guess I'm wondering who sitsci.org is really geared towards. Um, 
I guess, who would be your community of users? Is it um, more so, um, I guess, citizen science program managers, or is it for, you know, the broader general public? How does that work? Yeah, great question. Um, really great question, uh, Deja. It's, it's, a two, it's a two audience kind of model. We have two primary audiences, our project managers that are anyone out there, usually community groups, nonprofits, um, Girl Scout troops, um, you know, Boy Scouts, um, museums, science museums, and even um, academic professors at universities, but a lot of nonprofit organizations. Um, and those are project managers, that's audience one. Audience two is the volunteers. And so it's a train a trainer kind of model. Our project managers have an idea for a project and they go on to sit at org and they spin up a project. Um, they then tend to recruit um, with the help of SciStarter and other um, social networking kind of approaches to recruitment. They uh, help bring, they recruit volunteers. So we obviously support volunteers because they volunteers come to sitside.org and tell us where a bald, bald eagle was. They tell us what the pH of the water was. They tell us they saw a bat in this cave. They tell us they saw potholes. They, saw, they tell us they saw graffitis, they, what it, graffiti on a wall, whatever they do, they crowdsource you know, scientific observations of the natural world. Um, so obviously volunteers are part of sitside.org and they're a big part of um, citizen science on sitside.org. But the project managers tend to be our first primary audience because we're really trying to market to people inspired in communities to um, create community science projects for change. And so that's our first audience. And then of course, the volunteers making that change possible. And I think this is the perfect segue. I know we had promised a demo and we try to do one each week. Greg, if you're, if you're up for it, I think you should go ahead and share your screen and uh, show us the whole world of sitside.org. Sure, you betcha. Let me just uh, do that. Uh, I'd love to. Thanks, Carolyn. Let's see, here we go. I'll just bring up, uh, site here. I've got a million things going on, so bear with me. Um, so what's really, really inspiring to me is, is sitside.org is what communities make of it. Um, sitside.org is what you make of it as a volunteer, as a student at North Carolina State University, as a community leader at a nonprofit organization um, in Botswana. Um, what, what, it's, it's what people make of it. And that's what's inspiring to me at sitside.org. And so if we look at what's happening around the world of citizen science on sitside.org, we see the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies is extremely busy today. Um, and so they happen to be looking at, they've found some bald eagles literally just three days ago. Um, today look, making observations of eagle nests along the front range of Colorado. And so what we see is, is what communities bring to sitside.org are their passion for projects. Those passions can include studying gray water, like our off the roof project, which I'll, I'll highlight and mention, um, studying, studying water quality like Trout Unlimited volunteers, um, birds, um, exotic plants in Tucson, Arizona, the Yohoa watershed, looking at eutrophication from nitrogen and non-point source pollution in Ecuador to Alaska birds and bogs up in the far north to colonial water birds in San Francisco to vernal pool monitoring in Virginia um, for salamanders and in keeping track of our, our friends in, in pools <laughs> in Virginia. So this is just the first page of, of 900 plus projects. Um, really inspiring to see what folks are doing. Um, examples of what might be fun to look at for today, just in the water quality world, there's um, a lot to look at from Trout Unlimited. It's a nonprofit organization. They got inspired to look at water quality monitoring in the Marcella Shale region of Pennsylvania. And if we do a quick little dive into this particular project and we look at monitored uh, sites measured, um, we see a particular site in this particular site is located zoop, in, um, in the Allegheny National Forest right near Lake Erie. Um, and this is just amazing, but volunteers have been measuring various things, these things over many, many years on sitside.org. And so if we take a quick look at water temperature and air temperature over time, you can see trends and patterns in water temperature and air temperature. Um, 
over time since 2013 all the way through 2020 as of today. And then you can look and explore the descriptive statistics of these variables, looking at the normality of these distributions. So tons of science learning and more importantly, decision making with respect to water quality, um, man water managers in the region um, and looking at trends in water quality given a variety of activities from shale gas monitoring to, to other such things. So that's just one of many, um, just dropping back to the homepage of projects that are um, happening on sitsci.org. And I'm happy to dive deeper, but I, I, I wanna be sensitive to time as well, Carolyn. I have a question. Um, yeah, can anyone come in and download, um, can anyone come in and download data from these projects? Oh, for sure. It depends on the governance approach. So a um, quick little dive into our list of projects, um, a quick foray into page two of these projects will show a lot of different um, membership models. So there's, there's governance of who can participate in these projects. Some are what's called open projects and they will have a little blue, sorry, a little green O next to them for open projects. Those are crowdsource projects where anybody can participate. Here's one right here. This is an open project. You just click join and you're in. Uh, Member-based projects are where training is involved. You might go to a local li library in a non-COVID world when we can actually get together with people and um, actually get together and go to a local library and learn the protocol, learn the equipment, learn, learn where to get your, your litmus paper for the pH sampling. And so you, these are member-based projects where you simply ask to join. So there's join and ask to join for governance of who can participate. And then you'll see these little padlocks. Some projects are private data, meaning those managers have chosen to make the data available only to project members. Other projects with no padlock, like the Front Range Piker project um, is uh, public data. And therefore, even when not a member of that project, you can simply go to this project, look at its project statistics, log into sitside.org. You do have to be a member of this, the platform, but then download the data for open public project data set. So the open padlock is a public data set. This is a member-based project. You do have to ask to, to participate. So hopefully, Deja, that makes uh, iconic, easy understanding <laughs> to, to know. Most definitely. Um, I'm wondering, do you have a particular project on the sitsci.org um, page that you like, that you fancy? You know, I participated as a volunteer. I happen to be in the mountains of Colorado and I'm a big proponent of conservation and conservation for species that share this earth with us. Uh, us. So um, turns out this Front Range Piker project where we landed here is a good one, one of my favorites. Um, and so what's really neat about it is you can check out basically um, observations of piker populations. What this, the reason this is so important is in Nevada, in the Sierra Nevada, in the state of Nevada, the American pika ocotonal princeps has been brought to local extirpation in those mountain ranges in Nevada, given a changing climate. And there is concern here in the mountains of Colorado, just west of Boulder, Fort Collins, Denver, um, to say, okay, well, are, is the populations of American pika, this species, at risk of decline under a changing climate in this mountain range, uh, given what we saw happen in Nevada? And so volunteers, the story quickly goes that the Colorado Parks and Wildlife CPW, um, their budget has been cut lately and they've been unable to get to some 500 monitoring sites for this species. And with the help of the Front Range Piker Project, so about over the last seven, eight years, they've been now able to return with help of volunteers to all of those 500 monitoring sites and fill that data set to better understand population trends, trends over time. So this is really fun to check out. You can look at um, volunteers hike up many, many, many miles, seven, eight miles to our site um, in sometimes harsh conditions and look for these little critters. Um, they're quite beautiful. Um, so, so that's one of my favorites. Um, another one to mention is the Off the Roof Project, which en enlisted volunteers in four different cities from Miami to Tucson to Baltimore to Fort Collins to look at the fitness for use of water collected by rain barrels off of roofs. And the off the roof project was really fun. I'll pull it up because um, with the help of the Environmental Protection Agency, we've been able to have volunteers ship samples of this water. Um, so off the roof 
do a quick search. This was, there was some publications in the works. Um, and uh, I think they're worth noting that there's a lot going on in this, a lot of learning happening from the off the roof projects in four different cities across the US. So those are some favorites off the top of my head. Um, there's our rain barrels um, here in Fort Collins and, and Miami and Baltimore and Tucson. Um, so yeah, there's a couple examples. And really quickly, I put in the chat um, the blog we ran on Discover Magazine about Off the Roof, which kind of hints at a little bit of what, I know you, the more comprehensive publications are coming, but it hints at a little bit of what you all discovered. And um, somebody posted, why does it count on Monday? And um, I thought uh, Karen, Dr. Karen Cooper from NC State made a good point in the chat. She said, because many citizen science projects involve counting or tallying, tallying some observations and measurements. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of spotlight it. some of those projects on sitside.org, like the ones where it's like you're literally just counting. I'm sure you guys have some of those, right? Oh, yeah, sure. Counting. Um, you know, the, there's, there's all, so the, the bald eagle project is counting um, fledgling e eagles in nests. So that's a counting effort. Um, noxious weed projects are counting things, um, uh, counting noxious weeds, of course. Another one to mention in the counting realm, this is sort of counting, but it's extremely crowdsourced is Stream Tracker, um, which, of course, I forgot a space, um, which is really important in today's world given, there it is, um, given the, uh, the nature of, in the West, e ephemeral drying up streams. And so it, we've just been through a rather record-breaking drought which has led to rather record-breaking wildfires in the West. And um, one of the pitfalls of that sort of climate regime is wildlife have no water to drink. And so Stream Tracker is keeping track of those streams and they're counting how, where streams are running and where streams are not running. And so your task is quite simple. Go to a stream near you, take a photo of the creek and tell us if it's flowing or not. And it's that simple and it's an open, project. It's crowdsourced. You don't have to ask to join. Just just click the button on sit side, join and get going today. So it's a perfect project. In a COVID world, you can do this very safely um, from a social distance perspective. And uh, go tell it, go to the nearest creek you see and say, is it flowing or not? And here in the West, things dry up around this time of year. And so you can see a river bottom. It's kind of like a, obviously a creek, but it's not flowing, right? So we want to know about that. Wildlife biologists want to know about that. And so do the critters looking for water, right? So let's, ha let's help them find that water. A kind of follow-up question on this, like I'm looking at projects like Stream Tracker and like some of the other projects you've spotlighted. I'm wondering from the project leader's side, you know, let's say one of the NC State students who's here tonight adds a project to sitside.org and has people collect data. What does a project leader do to kind of handle data quality concerns? Because, um, you know, they're, they're getting data from anybody and everybody. Yeah, it's, it's definitely a challenge. And I'd say the techniques are diverse and varied. Um, some, so like the Off the Roof Project had um, graduate students in each of those four cities go collect rainwater samples as controls and send them to the EPA lab as well. Um, and sometimes we have what's called repeated observers. So like in the Front Range PICA Project, they're strategically um, assigning. So on sitside.org, you can have people take opportunistic observations of anything, anywhere. You can also have monitoring sites like these USGS gauging stations where you go to the creek and measure that pH at that, that exact location like we saw in the trend of the Trout Unlimited data. So when you have that sort of assigned sites set up, you can quickly uh, on sitside.org assign certain volunteers to certain sites and ask them to do repeated measures. And so basically for the PICA monitoring, a team of two, we always ask for two to go for safety because these are like eight mile treks into the back country. Um, but team, a team of two will go up, measure the PICA. The very next day, a separate pair of, of two volunteers will be measured that same site. And so what that repeated measures does is it allows in a statistical way to look at confidence of the data collected by volunteers and those corroboration. Additionally, in, in pretty much by and large, every project photos are taken as photo verification. Um, so if a volunteer said this was an American pike and it turned out to be a yellow-bellied marmot, you would know 
by looking at the photos. So there's a lot of QA, QC approaches. They're as diverse as the projects are on sitside.org. But um, almost, we leave that to the project coordinators um, to con you know, conceive of um, QA data quality assurance, quality control processes that fit the project. Um, and, the, and we suggest some to them as they start their journey. That's and awesome. Oh, just just a quick um, question. Can we actually look at a few of the photos through the stream tracker project? I'm sorry, I was reading chat and I should not have been distracted. One more time, Deja. <laughs> I was just wondering if we can actually go through some of the photos that have been submitted through the stream tracker. Project. Sure, yeah, you betcha. Yeah, we'll check one out here. Um, it just happens to be November 7th here in 2020. This is a very dry, dried up. We've, like I said, been through a very large drought. Um, oddly enough, we've seen very early snows as well. This is a, a natural area about 40 miles northwest of my home here in Fort Collins, Colorado. And if we zoom in and take a quick look at this photo, you'll see a dried up riverbed. And so and with some snow <laughs> recently had fallen. Um, so basically this is a river in the spring and um, it dries up in the fall. And the question, inquiring mind scientists of, of wildlife uh, management agencies, Colorado Parks and Wildlife want to know how, how is the dry up of these creeks changing over time? Is climate affecting that? To what degree? Um, is there a spatial pattern to the dry up of these rivers? Is that forcing wildlife to migrate to a, a larger river that's still flowing to get water? And so volunteers are basically taking a picture of this dry riverbed and saying no flow at this particular site. Yeah, great question. So yeah, it's pretty um, diverse um, topics. I mean, I think if I bop back a few, um, we can get back to the PICA project if I still have it up. Um, and we'll look at some photos. This might be, this might be the, the off the roof. No, this is stream Jacko. Well, I could do a quick search. Um, there's some fun photos of, of wildlife. Eagles are great to look at if you're interested in the photo side of things, which everyone is. Um, just as a quick note, we're also trying to expand into video and audio recordings for like sounds at night. Um, we saw Fort Collins go from a, a very you know, progressive, busy college town to deathly silent during the early onset of COVID. And um, we were quite interested and nobody did take us up on this, but we'd love to spin up a sit side project to actually record, you know, audio, audio sound, sounds at night as well. So here's some pica pictures. Um, I don't know if they're gonna actually have pica found and little critters in these photos. I'm looking at small thumbnails, but um, we, the volunteers, I've, I've been a volunteer for this site. They're asked to take the four cardinal directions at these sites. So they take a photo north, south, east, and west. And then of course of, of pica themselves, if you found them. Um, and it looks like they might have seen one here. Present, hmm, fun. Let's look at, maybe they heard it. I bet they heard it. So this is up in the high country of Colorado um, with a little volunteer though, instructed to hold these signs north, south, east, and west. And that the little critters live in the rocks of these, they call this talus. And um, yeah, yeah, so there's some photos. <laughs> so I see we have a really great question in the chat. And if someone was interested in hosting a project on sitside.org, how exactly would they go about that process? Um, you, you, great question out there, Nat Natalie, I love it. Um, so it's real simple, simply go to, you've got to create an account, so sign up and then log in and click this create a project button. It's that simple. I will log in, I do have an account, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, and um, we just log in and create an account and then simply fill out a few very short questions. And once filled out meeting the, the, you know, the number of characters we need and telling us where the project headquarters are located was the kind of the headquarters of the project. Um, some projects are of course national in scope and even global in scope. And so you do your best, um, but just a couple quick photo, a quick photo, like a logo, an organizational logo, a, a fun photo. And then these issues, these settings, how do you want to govern membership? How do you want to protect data privacy? Um, do you want communications back and forth between volunteers and yourself? And then uh, importantly for here today, 
um, do you want to simultaneously advertise on SciStarter? And you simply fill this out and this becomes active and then you submit and, and then you've got a project started. Um, but as we all know in citizen science, it looks what's, what looks simple to the naked eye is um, obviously a lot more complicated. And so there's a lot that goes, goes on behind the scenes to really make a successful citizen science project happen and be successful and meet its goals and objectives. And so this is your first step towards that journey um, to simply fill out that form and off you go. So I'm wondering, since you offered that perfect segue, do you have any tips on uh, for our audience out there on how they can manage a successful citizen science project? Yeah, you know, the, the number one thing I'd, I'd say, well, there's, there's maybe three points there. One is partner, 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 create partnerships. Um, partnerships really matter. And um, it, you can do more with more partners involved. Find partner scientists, find partner universities, find partner science museums, um, find partner nonprofit organizations, find partner opportunities to, to do volunteer recruitment, like the Friends of the Gardens on Spring Creek, for example, um, botanical gardens, um, bird conservancies. Um, so partnerships, number one. Number two, um, well thought out, um, it begin with the end in mind. How is the world going to change because this citizen science project, what your citizen science project was successful? Begin with that end in mind. Who's going to use the data for what purpose and why? Always ask why, start with why. Why are you doing this? If you know a clear answer, if you can give in an elevator 30 seconds or less, why this citizen science project is important. Example, off the roof. So we did not know in different parts of the world how fit for use water collected in rain barrels are. Should we and can we safely put this water on our gardens? Can we use it for potable water to drink? We don't know. The, the scientists needed to know an answer to that question. They clearly can say, we needed this citizen science project to help us answer that question. We knew why we were doing it. So number one, partner with people, get help. Number two, know why you're doing it. And then number three, um, I would say, um, really spend time thinking about the life cycle of a citizen science project and don't underestimate the magnitude of logistics. How do you recruit volunteers? How do you train volunteers? How do you support volunteers in an asynchronous world, in a COVID world? How do you communicate with volunteers? Um, and so be mindful of the work that it actually takes to do effective community science, citizen science. So great, great question. You know, since uh, I feel I, this is a kind of a question I get a lot. I'm interested to hear your answer to it. So we're fine with whatever term anyone uses, you know, if they call it neighborhood science, public engagement in science, citizen <laughs> science, community science. As long as people are doing science, we want to work with them at SciStarter. Um, and we tend to use citizen science because that's what the National Academies landed on. And we thought if it's good enough for them, and their, their reasoning made a lot of sense and was very logical. And we're like, that works for us. But I'm wondering, what's your stance on it, especially because you're called sitside.org? Do yeah. you use citizen science usually or community science? Or, we, or we use it all like SciStarter. We're, we're name agnostic. Um, our name is sitside.org. It's short for citizen science. Um, we certainly, our mission is to help you do great citizen science. That, that's our mission in life. That's what we want you to do. We want communities to do transformative, actionable, great citizen science. Um, whether that's called public science, whether that's called neighborhood science, um, participatory research, community-based monitoring, there's a, you can scientifically monitor the world. You can also scientifically experiment um, and you can run experiments about phenomena in the world. And so for us, we're like SciStarter, we're a bit agnostic when it comes to, to names um, and the semantics of what's in a name. Um, we work a lot in, in global context. Uh, we have a lot of projects in Costa Rica, in Africa, um, and you know, in the UK, they the tend to shy away from the term citizen science. What does it mean to be a citizen? Um, but for us, we are just trying to help people do all of these, these phenomena in general and do them well. I love that answer. And I have a quick follow-up because I was thinking through when you were giving us advice about starting a project 
If you had infinite resources and more importantly, infinite time, what project would you run? You know, if you suddenly had 24 extra hours in the day. You know, if I, I, I don't want to not answer your question, but I also am tempted to not answer your question. Um, because if I had that 24 hours, I would, put, I would very much want to selfishly build project, how do I say, support capabilities, added capabilities into sitside.org to amplify the impacts of citizen science at a platform level, rather than divest, you know, investing that 24 hours or the, that extra money in a single project personally. And that's just, it's just because I'm passionate about helping any community, whether they're, you know, Inuit peoples in the far North looking at their, you know, challenges with respect to climate change and sea ice melt and whatnot. Um, from a local ecological knowledge perspective, my passion is, is building capabilities so communities can study and make actionable decisions that are helpful to their quality of life. Um, and so I'd rather spend that money not doing a single project, but to build more capabilities for more people to do more of this type of work. I know that did, that skirted your question entirely. No, I'm sorry about that. But. I think that was a good answer because that's literally what you would do if days suddenly became twice as long. Um, we had a question kind of related to that in the chat. Someone asked, is sitsai.org available in languages other than Egypt, English, yeah, Portuguese, for example? That is a, a huge goal. That's where I would spend that 24 hours. <laughs> um, it's a goal of ours. And just so you know, we are right in the midst of launching a Sitsai 2.0 platform. And there's several reasons for why we've been spending the last two years literally overhauling this citizen science platform um, to launch Sitsai version 2.0, we call it. And the, one of the motivations was to build a cyber infrastructure, like a, a cloud-based, cloud-deployed database system of systems that can support uh, these millions of observations in a way that could be scalable to multi-language support. So we have people currently typing in Spanish in a variety of languages when they fill out that form I showed you, and that's totally legit. But what we really want to do is go above and beyond to really translate the entire site into other languages. Um, so that's uh, on our horizon. Same here at SciStarter. We've dabbled in like um, Spanish language events with um, partners who are have been awesome with helping us with translations. But yeah, having a multilingual website would be the dream. Yeah, we really want to do it right too. There's multiple ways to do this, but we'd really like to actually have a sitsai.org.ca or a sitsai.org. Um, you know, other countries, and actually have a domain dedicated to a fully translated uh, version of Sitsai. Um, and that's hard to come by, you know, it's going to take some work, but it's, it's a huge priority for us. That is awesome. I have a, a question related to, I guess, working with communities and what you were talking about with local ecological knowledge. I'm wondering if you can share with our audience the importance of including um, local and traditional ecological knowledge within citizen science projects. You know, if we have any um, researchers or professors um, in the audience who, you know, want to turn their research project into a citizen science project, can you just tell them a little about a bit about why it's important that we include that knowledge from local communities into citizen science? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, Deja, for that question. I really am interested in um, local ecological knowledge for the reason that the insights gained by being all inclusive with respect to um, the lived experiences of peoples. We now more than ever need to capitalize on the insights of all peoples um, to help us become more resilient, help us become uh, have greater qualities of life given global pandemics, given droughts, given catastrophic wildfires, given catastrophic hurricanes and flooding. Um, we need the insights of all peoples all, everywhere to help us come up with viable um, solutions to these grave challenges we face. And so from my perspective, um, I, I just have a deep passion for building out opportunities for people to bring to bring forth their insights, their local experiences, their local knowledge, 
um, with respect to the challenges they're facing. Um, so I'm inspired by projects that do that. Um, this is a project in, I think this was in Kenya, um, looking at, you know, bamboo plot studies. The, it, bamboo in, East, in, East, in the Horn of Africa, East Africa is used for firewood. It's used for building scaffolding, building, building materials, building supplies. It's a critical piece of, of their ability to live in a highly good quality of life situation. And so they've been trying to, in, in a pilot study, experimentally study different approaches to growing bamboo in more of a garden context. Um, so they don't have to go to the neighboring forests and cut down forests at um, alarming rates, which is um, of course challenging for wildlife and others. So, so it, these are sorts of things that are pretty inspiring to me, so for sure. Awesome. Um, I was wondering if you had any additional tips for anyone who is interested in co-creating a project with a specific community. I, I took a glance at chat one last time and I should never do that. Uh, could you repeat that question one more time? <laughs> Just wondering if you have any additional tips for anyone who is interested in co-creating a, a project. Yeah, so we really at SITSAI are very interested in co-created citizen science for those out there who know kind of contributory, collaborative and co-created flavors of citizen science. We're, we're very passionate about co-creating our platform we're very passionate about co-creating projects. And if I had advice in how to do that, I'd say that we, we're actually working on a, a, a guide, a field guide of sorts to co-creating um, projects. And that guide is focused on what we call the stakeholder assessment and situation analysis process or SASA, S-A-S-A -S -S -A process. And what, what a stakeholder assessment does is it helps you zoom out and think out of your box and say, who's not at this conversation? Even today, who are we not speaking with? We don't have participants. Well, I, I actually have done the Front Range Biker Project and Stream Tracker, but um, and I do Kokoraz in my backyard. But um, that you know that the the point is is who's missing from the conversation? Which stakeholders in the in like food pipelines? You know, food security, um, water quality, the water, the municipality. Who's using that water? Who wants to know more about that water? Who's not at the conversation? So the SASA process. It, zooms you out and says, let's talk to more inclusive stakeholders to understand the, what we call what keeps you up at night. So if you go to, it's one of the single best questions to ask co co people interested in co-creating a project is what keeps you up at night? And the municipality might be, we're really concerned about a salmonella outbreak in our water. That keeps them up at night. The local villager might be, I can't get enough water. I, I don't have access to that municipal water source at all. I go to the local well. And so I don't have enough quantity of clean quality water. So that's what keeps me up is night, at night is where do I get my water for my family's use, right? And so the, we like to say, find a very broad, cast a wide net of stakeholders, create a stakeholder matrix, find out what's important to them, and then see where those synergies between those, what keeps you up at nights and, um, so those are the, the whys to the project. And if there's a, a coalescing of those in that matrix, then you have a sweet spot of a, a really great co-created project. So I have a question about, um, um, this, is a, this is a question that can be geared towards either uh, you, Dr. Newman, or you, Caroline. I'm just wondering, what is the difference between SITSI.org and SciStarter? Um, I noticed that earlier when you were showing us how to actually um, host a project on SITSI.org, that one option is to um, advertise the project on SciStarter as well. So I was just wondering if either one of you could walk us through what some of those differences are. I can jump in really quick because I want to give um, Greg and his team a huge compliment in that they do something that I think is really, really important in that they host the projects themselves and give people a mechanism to get data and add data. SciStarter, we don't, as a rule, host projects. Um, we have built forms for people in the past, but we much prefer to be 
cheering sitside.org on and helping spread the word about their projects and helping uh, connect them to even more participants. I just put a link in the chat, for example, to our people finder. So once a sitside.org person creates a project and they add it to SciStarter, they can use our people finder to message all the SciStarter users in a given area and invite them to do the project. So like for off the roof where they were in, you know, very specific cities, they could message everybody in Denver and say, hey, participate in this project on sitsci.org. And because so many of those projects are SciStarter affiliates, people get credit in their dashboard for the number and frequency of their contributions, their SciStarter dashboard that is, um, which allows for like complimentary programs. Um, it allows for um, some really great like collaborations. Um, and I just wanted to give Sitsai.org a huge shout out for the work they do. I think it's really, really important. And um, I'm excited. I, I'm i not brave enough yet to start my own project, but one day I will. <laughs> and people will add data <laughs> via a form. But um, Greg, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, you know, I can, I, can, I can just echo everything Carolyn said. And it's been such a great partnership. I mentioned partnerships. And it, that goes for the platform folks in the world, too. And we've got a great one going between Sitsai and SciStarter. And you know, I, I would say that Carolyn nailed nailed everything spot on that, you know, the difference is we primarily focus on hosting projects and, and project data, whereas SciStarter networks people to projects in amazing ways. And, you know, case in point off the roof, I love the people finder um, shout out because we use the people finder in off the roof, like without a doubt. And every one of those cities cast a wide net and they got a lot of participation um, for participants of a variety of roof types. They were quite interested in different roof types and the effect of the roof type on the quality of the water obtained through the rain barrel. And um, so one of the, they, they used the people finder and then surveyed participants about what their roof types were and off they were. So um, it's a mutually beneficial situation where we don't have the network SciStarter has for recruitment and social networking amongst participants um, and keeping track of participants across their participation in the broad citizen science community. We just don't have those capacities. And so by bringing these two platforms together, we, we're really offering a lot more um, capability together than we would by ourselves. Um, so just different niches with synergistic um, work. I'll mention that um, the director of SciStarter, Darlene, Cavalier and I literally just these, these last few days have been working very hard to bring together a greater integration of SITSI and SciStarter than we already have. And that integration, we actually hope to deploy the data sheets that are created on SITSI into and embed them into SciStarter. So that's kind of where we hope to go in the future. Always got to have more on the list of things to do. So. Thank you. I mean, I think that's a great example of um, collaboration, co-creation, and partnerships right there. We have an additional um, question in the chat um, from Natalie. Natalie says, are SIDSI.org and SciStarter open source platforms? Ah, great question, Natalie. Um, yes, we are. We have made SITSI 2.0 um, open source and built on entirely open source components. We have a GitHub repository for those in the crowd that are programmers. Um, Natalie, we have not yet released that because we haven't launched the platform. And so it's right now a private repository um, with an eye towards opening up that repository post launch for contributions to build us widgets. <laughs> if you're a developer who wants to help platforms to develop great new widgets for, for fe you know, features for volunteers, we would welcome that. Um, it would more likely be under the GNU open source license um, as a code base down the road when we do launch. So stay on the lookout for that. Um, and do you all have a launch date already set for? <laughs> that has been really challenging. <laughs> um, if you've ever done software development, you know just how hard that holy grail question is. We were hoping to launch like October and we have clearly missed that. Um, we're moving into December. Our goal is to be all ready to go at the end of December, 
That's, of course, I said that <laughs> a month before October. Um, so it's very challenging because the, the reason is we're actually having to migrate all of this data into this new platform. And so that has proven more difficult. We're also commensurate launching three mobile apps, um, uh, or get two organizational specific apps, one for the Leave No Trace Center for Outdoor Ethics and the other for the Left Hand Watershed Center. And then the third, of course, is our own mobile app, which we're re-releasing re um, as a much improved app that's native for Android and iOS. Um, so we're busy people, extremely busy people. This launch is proving very difficult, but I can, I, I can say with confidence that for the spring push, um, we will for sure be ready. Hopefully December at the latest January. So very soon. Awesome. That's so exciting. Um, you answered one of my follow-up questions there because I was wondering if you all were planning on integrating all of this into an app, um, which is awesome because people can just go out into the field or, you know, and make their observations and make their daily observations count. So I love to hear that. Yeah, we're excited about it. It's the, it's been a long time coming for us, um, and we sign up for our newsletter. Um, you know, send us an email at webmaster at sitside.org. We'll happily share out news as we know it um, about the launch of these products. I, I you know, I, I at risk of just why not? You know, I could certainly show you the development side of this thing. So sitside 2.0. This is all fake testing data at this point, but just a sneak peek for those who happen to see Make It Count Mondays. The project list is a lot different. It's a lot nicer. And the, the main page of these projects have gotten a lot more colorful. So you've got a lot more fun <laughs> um, with this dashboard. And these are management specific features. There's quick links to invite members, create data sheets. It's just a lot nicer interface. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of excitement around the SITSI team. We're extremely busy. Um, so stay, stay connected. You got your nice new profile, um, quick links to my projects. Um, this is also fully integrated with the Zooniverse now, which we're very excited about um, so that you can sync up your photos and have a subsequent crowd on the Zooniverse classify those images with respect to certain things. I'll put a shout out to the Mountain Goat Project, um, which is a project studying um, uh, the loss of the fur of goats. Um, and so what's fascinating about this project, and this just got published in Ecology and Evolution, um, the results of this study, but they needed an easy way for photo photograph photographers to submit photos of mountain goats and then they needed a subsequent easy way for volunteers to etch a sketch the amount of the body that still had fur and at what time of the fall did they still have the fur. And so this is really cool because we actually crowdsourced two different things with two different platforms that led to a scientific publication. So this is our mountain goat project. Those amazing photos of goats. And so what they did is they, they submitted a bunch of mountain goat photos of these just amazing goats and then on the Zooniverse, a subsequent asynchronous body of volunteers actually sketched the photo of this goat. And that allowed us to calculate how much of, fur, how much of the, the body had this fur and how much did it lose the fur. And then that allowed us to answer questions of, is climate change affecting when they molt? And that's important because they're kids, literally called kids. <laughs> um, the little baby goats um, might be at risk of an early snowstorm and they might shiver and freeze. And so we're concerned about the wildlife's welfare under changing climates given um, the shifting climate. So scientists are studying this. And so sure enough, they were able to crowdsource this science both collecting photos from his, historical photos and say over time, have they started re losing this fur earlier in the season or later? That's a mouthful, but that's another fun example, so. That is so cool. Um, we are so excited and I guess waiting on the edge of our seats for the release of Sisai uh, 2.0. And uh, we are getting down to the last few minutes of our program tonight. And I, you know, have one last question, of course, just wondering if you have um, 
anything that you wish everyone knew about citizen science or community-based monitoring? Yeah, great question. You know, I wish um, people would know about it, um, which is why SciStarter is so exciting to me because the, the, a megaphone for citizen science and citizen science needs that. But I wish they also know that there is means through which all of the contributions of volunteers, so agency, you have agency to make a difference in your community, make some important measurements of important things of concern to you and actually have that information inform decisions made by your local municipality, made by your state government, even made by the national level. Um, even the UN from a sustainable development goal perspective, you have agency. And I think all too often we feel helpless, unable to move the needle, make the, our world and our quality of life better. But if there was one thing I'd want people to know about citizen science is it's a means by which you have agency to make your world and the world of your community better. I love that. Those are great final words of wisdom, as well as a call to action to everyone out there in the audience. So I would like to say thank you so much, Dr. Newman, for joining us this week and for sharing your knowledge. This was so much fun. We loved hearing about your project, um, about sitside.org and the variety of projects that you enjoy. Um, thank you all for attending. I'm going to pass the mic to Caroline for any last final words. Yeah, I, I think you've said it all, Deja. Um, and thank you so much to you both. Um, I love Mondays because of Make It Count Monday. And um, thank you to all of our audience members for being passionate. This is, I think, the most Q&A engagement we've ever gotten. So uh, there's definitely a sitside.org fan base, I think, who showed up tonight. So have a great night, everybody. Thanks again. Well, a huge thank you. Shout out to you, Carolyn and Deja. Thanks for spending your Monday evening. Um, you are making it count. So thanks so much. For I coming. spoke too soon. We had a long <laughs> question come into the chat. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> Let's take it. Let's take it. <laughs> we'll spend our last two minutes. Wow, this is a paragraph. <laughs> we said our goodbyes. We had a call to action. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, yes, yes, yes. OK, so more than one photo sub submission per observation. For example, a fixed transect with three photos and measurements related to each photo. It is really difficult to record the photos together and not lose their relation. So um, to Natalie, I do have a lot of thought on that very detailed question. It's an awesome question. It's actually one of the things that as a plant ecologist, we are very motivated to support. And we actually have done a lot of work towards that goal. So for example, most of our data sheets are what we call a point. It's like at this point on, in the world, I recorded X and that's usually the case. We actually do in 1.0 current sitside.org today, allow you to submit four photos up to four photos, but in 2.0, it's unlimited. So we're really excited about this launch. Second answer to your question is these more complex protocols. We're very passionate about, and we believe very firmly that, and we've seen in co-created projects that volunteers can do structured scientific data collection in addition to the ad hoc observation. So yes, citizen science is ad hoc observations in some cases and crowdsourcing um, millions of ad hoc observations about things is very important in some flavors of citizen science, but so do projects train volunteers to follow rigorous protocols. Transects are a big example. So as a plant ecologist, we do Dauben mile transects, we do nested plots, modified Whitaker plots. To the trained scientist, this is gonna get geeky, but why not? And um, so we do those things and you can actually specify that your protocol be set up to follow a transect design, in which case there's relationships withheld from subplot A to subplot B to subplot C across that transect. That's extremely difficult to support. We do support it um, marginally. We'd like to expand it in the future in 2.0 and um, our database is structured to kind of do that. So two answers to short answers to your question. There's some support for protocols and transects and in 2.0, there will be unlimited photos allowed for any observation. So for example, you might take an overall four cardinal direction photos. You might be asked to take a photo of the nest. You might be asked to take a photo of the plant. 
And you can do that and it'll relate the photo to that observation, like the amount of trash at a particular location. And so we are building in those relationships um, and we're letting you replicate the number of photos with a simple plus button as many times as you'd like. Um, so hopefully that answers that really great question. Um, we have a lot more work to do on the protocols. But yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And thank you, Natalia, for your question. Um, I will say, uh, we also had another question in the chat asking, when is the next Make Account Monday? You can find us here every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern. And um, I've dropped a link to the list of topics and you can find the list of topics on slicestarter.org uh, backslash ncsu-home. And so go on, go on there and check out our episodes for um, future weeks and join us here next Monday if you enjoyed today's episode. And with that, I guess we'll see you all next week. Wonderful, thanks everyone.